So Philo came, Philo GL came out a few months ago? Yeah. When's one? Yeah, a few months ago, yeah. Pretty compelling demos. You had a great one this week with the flights, by the way. I love that one. Are you going to show that today? Thanks. Yeah. So I just blew it for you. Sorry about that. No, no problem. Okay. <laughs> well, Philo GL is a, it's a really exciting project coming out of a really exciting company. And uh, here's the guy who put it together. So let's hear from him. Thanks. So um, Philo GL, uh, WebGL framework for data visualization, creative coding, and game development. So uh, a little bit about my background first. Um, I work for a company that's called Sencha. In Sencha, we make uh, JavaScript frameworks uh, for desktop, mobile, and other devices. Uh, we do everything with JavaScript. So basically, server-side JavaScript, client-side JavaScript, et cetera. So I work on the graphics team. Um, my main two domains of expertise are data visualization and JavaScript, which is kind of funny because I think, well, someone was asking, like, how come with a webish sort of like JavaScript background you got into graphics, but uh, when you're doing web, either it's 2D canvas or other stuff, you're doing UI, you're doing graphics too. So um, my main approach may be a little bit different than the other frameworks. So I consider that if you have an HTML document, uh, I think that most of the people think that a WebGL application is a WebGL canvas. And maybe because I am JavaScript developer, I think about a web application, WebGL application as a uh, 3D content that is, that is actually enhanced by all of these uh, JavaScript APIs. So basically how to use you know, multi-threading support with web workers, uh, interact with the file API, uh, or other type of getting data synchronously, XHR, uh, or using images, video, 2D canvas to uh, post-process, pre-process images, use them as textures, etc. So all this 3D content actually enhanced by uh, all these other APIs that are actually available because the browsers are uh, modern enough. So just to try to, you know, uh, go to a practical example of what I'm talking about, I'm going to show this example. So basically, what this does is um, it shows a video, an HTML5 video in real time, and what it does is it takes each frame of the video, it pastes it on a 2D canvas, and then it gets the RGBA array from that canvas. And then it groups uh, those pixels uh, by color, and it shows them on in our GB cube. So what you can see is um, a real-time uh, 3D uh, color decomposition of an image. So here's the WebGL app, but actually, uh, you actually are using other stuff too. So we're using like web workers to create the models. And then we're using the 2D canvas and then we're using the HTML5 video. And uh, so then you can use other type of color schemes. So for example, you can use HSL. Um, the interpolations are done via in the shaders and you can use HSV. So this is what I mean when I say, you know, having the 3D content enhanced by all these other uh, APIs. Um, another example of this is, um, so the word temperature changes. Uh, this is done with um, NASA imagery. So basically what I do is I take uh, 2D images uh, provided by NASA, which you can see on the top right, right? Yes, right part of the screen and I track the temperature differences. I create a 3D model out of that where the peaks are where uh, the temperatures are higher and uh, blue parts are where the temperatures are cooler. So as you can see in 1880, uh, wasn't too bad. 1890, wasn't too bad either. But if you go to 1990, we'll see that it kind of gets bigger and in 2000, uh, well, it's exploding. So yeah. I'm not altering the data, so just like come up with your own conclusions about what's happening in the world. Um, so in this case too, I'm kind of loading dynamically all the images, and I'm pasting it in a 2D canvas, and I'm taking the average of all the colors on that, that 2D canvas to create this uh, sort of 
square with the average color of the temperature. And I'm also using that to the canvas to create a 3D histogram or sort of like a, a model. So a little bit about the framework that I use and develop to, to kind of do that, these sort of things. Um, PhiloGL has, yeah, it's focused on three main things. Uh, idiomatic JavaScript, so it's an API that sits on top of uh, the WebGL API, which resembles a lot to the OpenGL ES API, and it doesn't need to uh, in a framework, so uh, it's a way of abstract that sort of API. Um, a rich model system, so everything is split onto models. This is going to be very good for the next versions because it will allow you to make your own build of the framework, have a very lightweight framework in which if you don't really want to use quaternions, for example, why downloading them? Uh, if you don't really want to use I.O., why download it? So you just make your own build and it's very lightweight. Um, and it's flexible, so you have always uh, handled to the GL context if you really want to do you know, fine grain stuff, uh, and it's performance focused. So up to the part of idiomatic JavaScript, just I'm gonna show a, a few examples of like how low level API gets, you know, translated into more high level API within the JavaScript, um, uh, within PhiloGL. So let's be concise and expressive. If you go on to uniforms, um, so the WebGL API provides you with 20 different types of uniforms that are uh, typed. So uh, considering that JavaScript is weakly typed, the best way is to you know, group all those uniforms in just one uniform and say, you know, program set uniform, the name of your uniform and uh, mixed value. Uh, for buffers, it's a very uh, similar approach. So if you wanted to uh, store a vertex buffer, you would have to, um, to a position attribute uh, you have to get that position location within the shader, then enable that uh, attribute array, then create a buffer, then bind the buffer, bind the data to the buffer. And then when you want to render, you would have to you know, bind the buffer again and do vert vertex attribute pointer. So uh, within PhiloGL, you only get one method, which is set buffer in your application. So you put the name of your buffer, which matches with the name of the attribute. Of course, uh, sometimes you want uh, to have many different buffers that target the same attribute, this can be done too with just specifying the attribute at attribute attribute, um, the size of the buffer and the value. So, and then if you want to bind the buffer, you just set true. If you don't want to bind it, you set false. So basically, uh, very concise. Um, for textures, it's the same thing. So if you wanted to load a texture, you would have to create one, create an image, uh, set the source of the image and then uh, wait to the asynchronous call of the onload of the image to set a whole bunch of uh, um, properties. And this is just for one image. So if you had to load 20 images, you would have the problem of trying to syn synchronize all asynchronous uh, callbacks of onload. So this with PhiloGL, you just use the IO model. You call textures, you pass in an array of images, um, and then when you get the uncomplete, you just set the texture. So this is how I think uh, it should feel on the JavaScript way and not, not so much uh, on the OpenGL, yes. Uh, for programs, well, I'm not gonna even describe what, what you have to do to compile and link programs for from script tags, which is, I believe, uh, sort of like bad practice to embed you know, a shader, uh, language into a script tag. What, what does it mean semantically to have a script that has shader language, that, which is not a scripting language? It's weird. So you, have, you get three different calls within the program class uh, from shader sources, in which you can pass in uh, your, your shader source uh, string. Uh, from shader URIs, which is the best way, I believe, to code. You just have your own shader folder which, with your shader files. You can edit them in a different editor for sh shaders, and then you call them um, via from shader URIs, and an Ajax call will be requested to get those files and uh, compile them and link them. And then from shader URIs, so then you can grab the DOM elements script tags if you want to do it that way and compile and link. Um, it is very declarative. So basically, this was the low-level API. 
but then if you want to create um, an application, I hope you can kind of see the code, um, you just have to call one function, uh, which is called philogl. And you pass in the canvas ID, and then it's the descriptor object for the application is pretty simple. So you get different sections. So the program or programs, how do you want it to be? A camera, how do you want it to be? The textures, how you describe them? Uh, a scene with lighting and different events, callbacks too. So you don't really have to worry about anything. Uh, it'll create the entire application and, uh, and run the onload callback with an application handle. So this is like super straightforward uh, creation of a program on WebGL. So what does the application instance has well it has the gl context and a whole other bunch of things that will be pretty useful to make your application so as you can see low level and high level stuff uh, then there's a module system so as i said before i'm not concentrating only on having um, a webgl canvas stuff but also to try to ease the use of other apis so javascript apis so uh, some highlights of this would be, um, for example, the math classes. Well, uh, the math classes have generic methods. I don't know if you know what a generic method is, but instead of having an instance and call that uh, method from the instance, you can have a generic method that you can pass in two instances or two objects that resemble that instance. Sounds complicated, but it's not. Um, so then I use a lot web workers. So imagine that you, as I was saying before, you, you, you want to implement the uh, implicit 3D equations, right? The marching cubes algorithm, something like that. So what it does is it takes a big cube and it subdivides it into many smaller cubes. So a good idea would be to try to use workers to divide the first cube into eight, an octree, so eight other cubes, and then send in that information onto different threads, and then once each thread had made the, the, the margin queue algorithm, you collect all that information from the threads. So you're gonna be gaining, well, a lot of speed by doing that. So it's, uh, it works on the divide and conquer map reduce uh, uh, paradigm. So basically you create a worker group uh, with the number of workers you'd like. Uh, in my example, it would be eight, for example. And then you map in on each worker a configuration that would be a subgrid, for example, for the margin cubes algorithm. And then you reduce all that information and you merge all the vertices, arrays, normals, et cetera, and you print on the screen. Um, so that's useful for that. Um, then you have a reach in mobile ready event system. So I implemented a, an event system for clicking, right clicking, and things like that that don't come out out of the box from, um, from JavaScript. Uh, but also implemented stuff to handle touch start, touch move, touch end events. So eventually, or not that eventually, uh, for example, Fennec, I think that has already that WebGL support. Uh, you can interact with the screen with your touch events. So that's pretty cool. Um, other stuff, for example, the IO model lets you load in JSON data uh, from same domain or cross domain. So I use the JSONP technique, so you can load in information from different domains uh, well, animations using request animation frame and stuff like that, easing, different transitions for easing, other things. And, uh, yep. So, and other examples of this. So, in this example, let me try to, if I can, clear the browsing data so you can see how things are loaded. As you can see, you're loading the airports data, or building models via workers, I'm getting always feedback from that, and then I'm loading airline data. So this is airline travels or routes. Um, so if you load a new airline, you can see on the top right that it will tell you that the JSON data, data is being loaded with a percentage, and once it's loaded, you, you get instant feedback from that. Um, so it's very kind of data centric too. So it's driven onto making data visualization. So loading the data and all that stuff, uh, the code for making that is already there. Uh, let's see if I can minimize. <coughs> so 
So he, this example has three layers. Um, I forgot to say that actually in the event system, you can set in picking to true and it'll enable color type picking. So this, this example has three layers. For example, it has a map and has a layer, a layer of cities that has 1700 cities and then the layer of like the Bezier curves that make the, um, the path. And on the cities, you could uh, turn on the picking uh, algorithm and then you could sort of like click on each city and interact with it. Uh, it actually works, but the points are so so small that it's actually not easy to click on them. So uh, turn that off. Um, another example is just to try to visualize uh, parametric equations, so like 3D equations um, in which uh, you can change in also the time uh, parameter, so the equation changes with time, so you can loop in this and interact with it at the same time. So I'm trying to always structure my programs into creating procedural models in the worker and keeping the UI thread free to let you interact with it and try to uh, give you information on how the processing is done all the time. You can also choose grid or uh, other equations. And before I, I forget, like I spent like most of half of the time in the framework actually doing documentation and try to build some useful and comprehensive examples out of this. So it is very easy for you to get started. So uh, I'm gonna actually go to that page now, show you. So um, for me too, the WebGL lessons were really helpful and uh, I was based more of the lessons, uh, I was based on all of the lessons to translate them into PhiloGL code. So, for example, the moon example um, would give you, well, the moon here, and then you would see the PhiloGL code that actually uh, it creates that example. So it's pretty easy. You get the moon model, you create a PhiloGL application with the camera, some texture, the moon texture actually, and then events which are super high level. So on drag start, on drag move, and on mouse wheel to zoom in and out. So this is pretty straightforward. Plus, uh, you have some default shaders with already point lighting, directional lighting, and the lighting fog, uh, and other stuff. So you, if you want to get started, you don't want to write shader code. You, you already have some default shaders there. Oh, I was forgetting about the documentation. Yeah, so and then you have some complete API docs. Um, I'm very paranoid into try to make the best API, API docs I can. So basically a lot of explanations of how the scene class works, uh, a lot of the syntax on how to create a scene, scene options, um, a lot of examples on how to instantiate them. And uh, of course, if you ever think there is a typo in the docs, you can go to this link. It will tell you, t take you directly to the uh, GitHub repo in which you can edit the file right on the HTTP page and like submit a pull request for the docs. And that's pretty much it. That's the project page, uh, me on Twitter and my home page. Thanks. Beautiful. Um, any questions? There's a couple down there. Ken, why don't you start and then I'll hit them with the mic. So you mentioned that you try to generate models on a worker and then send them over to, you, to the UI thread. So given that you're post messaging some fairly large object, how well is that working? And uh... Well, the, the worst case scenario I had until now was the marching cubes algorithm. And it did work quite fine, but I was using eight different workers, so the, the uh, the amount of vertices and stuff were divided by eight. So I didn't have any big troubles out of that, but yeah. So the, the main problem I had maybe is that I would definitely like the API for workers to be extended to enable typed arrays, 
So for now, you just have JSON, and maybe it would be faster if you could re just receive like the, the float 32 stuff. Um, can you talk a little bit about your scene format? My what, I'm sorry? <coughs> scene. My C format? Scene, S-C-E-N-E. Oh, scene, sorry, yeah. Sorry, my voice So, is... no, no, no problem. Um, so, as you may see, the application creation is just a, an object. So you have like an application descriptor and then you get in a JSON for the scene. Thanks. Hi. So uh, the scene format gets, um, let's say a light lights object that has like an ambient light RGB object and then like some uh, array of point lights, which are also RGB objects with some extra positions too. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much, oh well, and then you have effects. So those are scene effects. So those are like, uh, for example, if you wanted fog, that would be applied on the whole scene. So you would have uh, an array of different effects uh, to apply to the scene. Uh, just uh, implemented fog, I think. Um, another question, Are you? do you have or are you moving toward a library of 3D uh, data visualization objects and functions? seems your examples are approaching that, but are you moving in that direction? Uh, I'm mainly focusing on the data. So like if I can load the data easily, then I can create the models out of that. I do have like a model that um, that is based, that has some primitives and some models and stuff, but I, yeah. I don't have specific. You don't, you don't have a library of spherical objects and then functions you can perform on data on the spheres. Yes, that, that I do, yeah, I do. But what I don't have, for example, is like a, a 3D scatter plot, and you make like new 3D scatter plot, I don't have that. Okay. That is, um, that, so uh, since I come from 2D data visualization too, I had a framework that actually had those things, but it's much more work to have to implement each one of those classes than to actually provide a low level API for other people to create those things easily. But yeah, with time I guess that the examples will become the next classes and stuff. Any more questions? Ken? For your um, parametric uh, surface viewer, like, how, could you go into a little more detail about how that works? I mean, are you generating the mesh every time, or are you doing deformation in the vertex shader, or how, do you, how does it work? So, the, yeah, there are two main um, methods I'd use. One would be to compile the entire function. So, I didn't mention, but you can actually edit the function and like put in the, the in the input the function you want. One way would be to translate that function into a shader function and always pass in the mesh of a plane and apply that function. Um, unfortunately, that didn't work with my specific case uh, because I needed something else. I don't remember now what, but like I started with that because it is based on another example that used to use that uh, by Dean McNamee, uh, a person who used to work at Google. Um, but I changed that and I, instead that I used the worker. I don't remember exactly the cause, like that was the first example I don't remember anymore, sorry. <laughs> okay, you guys all set? Let's give them a hand then. Thanks. <laughs>